Welcome, welcome to you all. Welcome to this special Aleph Trust event, exploring the deeper meaning of the corona pandemic and its ramifications. Uh, my name is Jessica Bockler. I'm one of the co-founding directors of the Aleph Trust and I'm your session chair today. I'd like to give you some context first of all, um, tell you a little bit about the Aleph Trust and then frame the session for you before we begin. The Aleph Trust is a non-profit organization based in the UK and we're active in education and in community service and we deliver community programs in health, in well-being, in personal development, um, as well as postgraduate courses in consciousness studies, integral and transpersonal psychology. And these are fields which um, adopt a, a kind of cross-disciplinary, cross-cultural perspective, integrating scientific knowledge and wisdom which arises from the spiritual and indigenous traditions. And we offer our programs in response to the the need really that we perceive for individual as well as collective transformation today uh, so that we can collectively begin uh, to shift towards more sustainable, more equitable, more regenerative and co-creative ways of being which honor our unique potential but also aid the flourishing of all life on earth. And with me today are six of my colleagues from the Aleph Trust who are transpersonal scholars, they're writers, teachers, practitioners, and I'll introduce you to them later on, and I invite them to share with us their perspective on the deeper significance of the corona pandemic. So we'll have six short presentations, as well as some contemplative practice and a little bit of free writing practice for our kind of personal reflection and shared reflection. And we'll also take a, a good amount of time in the second half of the session to dialogue with each other, to share questions, to share insights, to really observe and share what is it that we're collectively, collectively perceiving of what is happening in the world today. As we begin, I'd like to honor this moment, this shared moment by lighting a flame a lamp. And as I light this lamp, I'd like to invite you to hold in awareness the, the pain and the suffering that is endured by so many around the world at this moment in time due to the corona pandemic, the climate emergency, but also war and civil unrest, or indeed social and racial inequalities and injustices that are enduring to this day. At the Aleph Trust, we stand in solidarity with marginalized and repressed communities around the UK and around the world. And we're committed to building a peaceful and a thriving world between us all. So let's take a moment right at the start of the session to feel more deeply into the body our body. You might want to adjust the posture on the chair. Allow yourself to settle, relax, feeling into the body more deeply. Bringing awareness to the breath and the heart. Let's take a deep breath together. I'm going to light the lamp.
There's no doubt in many people's minds that we're at a global tipping point. We're collectively facing problems in many different domains of our lives, which are unprecedented, complex, intensifying, it seems, and converging. And these problems are hard to solve because they're global. There seems to be no central authority which can address them. And also the, the systems and the mindsets with which we have been trying to solve these problems are by and large also causing them. And if we do not manage to solve these problems, the consequences are extreme. We're faced with death and destruction. And I think we can see this so graphically now. It's become a reality for some already. And you may be thinking of the, the rising death tolls in relation to COVID-19. But of course, we can also think of people dying as a result of rising economic turmoil and resulting poverty, mental ill health, domestic violence, addiction. And you can think of those who've been affected by wars and by civil unrest in some parts of the world. And also, as we've seen so dramatically in the news in the United States recently, we can think of the lives of those that are lost in activist efforts for social and for racial equality. And we also must think beyond the human sphere and hold in awareness the one million species that are at risk of extinction from human activities. So the deadly consequences of our myopic and egotistic mindsets and behavior are all around us. And yet, at least I hope, and I think many of you share this hope, we may sense that there is a possibility right now that something is beginning to shift. As our multifaceted crisis is intensifying, we're beginning to perceive more and more of our global interconnectedness. We're recognizing that we can't approach issues in isolation, trying to fix them locally and partially. And we understand that we need to galvanize collective will in order to facilitate change, large scale change. And in the case of COVID-19, we can see that we are best served already. We can see this, we're best served by a collective effort in responding to the crisis, sharing data from scientific research, sharing strategies, and not being limited by the perhaps artificial borders and boundaries of political ideologies and nation states. Yet if we're about to, if, if we want to bring about profound change in our human presence on earth, we kind of can't stop there. We need to consider the deeper layers of our interconnectedness. From a transpersonal perspective, we need to perceive interconnectedness not only as a biological and social phenomenon, but really as a, a psychic reality a kind of source condition of our very being. Transpersonal writers and practitioners affirm that we live in a participatory reality, at the roots of which there exists a shared mind, a collective consciousness, arising from a field of essence and information and potential, which underpins and informs our individual and conscious experience. And that is what we need to remember that we're born of this deeper source. We are born from this deeper source. It means remembering our wholeness. And these ideas aren't new. They're part of our heritage, our indigenous and our spiritual heritage. These practices, indigenous and spiritual, have given us ways to engage with expanded awareness 
and to receive information from this deeper field which unites us with all other living beings, with nature, with earth, with the cosmos. And so today I want to explore, we want to explore the corona pandemic from this transpersonal vantage point to discern the deeper significance and the deeper implications. And so it's a great pleasure for me to introduce our first panelist who will be sharing a short presentation with you. We have lined up six short presentations. We'll be sharing those with you and then we'll be taking a good amount of time also to be engaging in discussion, question, taking questions, um, dialoguing with each other. And our first speaker is uh, Les Lancaster, who is a co-founding director of the Aleph Trust, and he's dean of the Aleph Trust. He's also professor emeritus of transpersonal psychology at Liverpool John Moores University in the UK. And he served as a chair of the transpersonal psychology section of the British Psychological Society, as well as uh, president of the International Transpersonal Association. And his research interests really focus on the cognitive neuroscience of consciousness and its connections with mysticism, and specifically focusing on Kabbalistic psychology. So, Les, over to you. Thank you, Jessica. And let me echo that warm welcome to all who have come to this webinar. Corona, living the myth. Well, we are all living this myth. And lest there be any confusion, let me say here at the outset, if you think I mean by the word myth something that is unreal, then probably you're in the wrong webinar. On the contrary, myth is profoundly real. It's real in the sense that it expresses the dynamics of the deep psyche. The deep psyche is part of us individually, but also there's that collective collective, the collective psyche. The collective psyche is not merely human. It is our, our connection with, with everything. We are the microcosm. We embody the, the totality. So the forests, the mountains, the creatures, they are all expressions of the collective psyche. We are expressions of the collective psyche also. Psychological science is really fundamentally about how we create meaning. We live in a world of meaning, webs of meaning, and of course that's true at the ego level. Why did anything happen? It wasn't my fault. It was their fault. It was his fault. It was your fault. It's the Chinese virus. We, we did, that's automatic. We habitually assign meaning and causes. At the core of meaning is that sense of cause and effect. And uh, so tra transpersonal psychology is the same, uh, the same frame, but applying that to the deeper psyche. So how do we assign meaning and cause in the myth we're living. I want to draw on a comparison. 2,000 years ago in Jerusalem there was a temple. It was destroyed by the Romans. This was a cataclysmic event, a whole trauma that reverberates in many ways down to our day. Uh, Christianity arose from the demise of the temple as, a, as an effective place of worship. The destruction of the temple gave rise to a new form of Judaism, and from this also later Islam developed. The mindset that developed through this common era, because we, we date the common era from that time, the mindset that developed has, has influenced all regions of the globe. Except, of course, where indigenous peoples have not had the kind of contact that has influenced technology, civilization, etc. Anyway, that's not the main story I want to be interested in here. The, the crucial point I want to suggest, I want to discuss, is how 
the sages who forged a new form of Judaism from the ashes of that temple, how did they understand this trauma? So they wrote about this and they saw the cause as being baseless hatred within their community. It would have been so easy to say, oh no, it's the Romans, they did this, the baddies, they're out there. No, they looked inwards. And I think this is the logic of the collective psyche, the more profound way of understanding. And as I'm sure you realise, I think that's what we have to do in our current situation. Let me draw the parallel. No, there's a kind of symbolism here. Baseless hatred is an evil in the heart and it disunifies the community. The, the, a temple is fundamentally a place of unification. It's a place to meet with the one at the core of creation. And so it's very clear, how can you have a place of unity if you have no unity in your hearts? And that's what I want to link to our situation. How can you have ease of breathing when half the biosphere in which you are heart cannot easily breathe. And in making that comparison, I also think about George Floyd. It's so kind of symbolically connect, connected. You know, his uh, last words, I cannot breathe. We are experiencing a dis-ease of breathing. And of course, the point is that those who are dying sadly dying from the corona pandemic it's a problem of the breath so this soul level of being I mean, it's not just a neat metaphor symbols are not just neat metaphors but they are the very language that the soul understands and this is what i mean when I talk about the corona complex, it's a complex, it's not just a virus. There's a whole complex that is symbolizing where we are up to and what we need to do. I mentioned breath, of course. In many languages, breath is spirit. Breath is the link between within and without. It's our connection to the wider world. And quarantine, being locked down, of course that relates because it's an issue of boundaries, understanding the boundaries, understanding how we reevaluate our connections. This shift we're experiencing from the local to the global is also critical. In the essay I wrote, which some of you may have looked at, um, I made reference to 50 years ago when the first pictures of the earth as a globe were transmitted. And 50 years ago, we're kind of seeing uh, the next cycle. It's a hugely psychological impact. Of course, there are changes in economics it's brought about by this. And the virus itself, the virus, is about our relation with the animal world. And in fact, the virus more generally is um, at the boundary between life and non-life. And that point about boundary, again, all myth creates a liminal space, time, and the threshold, that's what we're experiencing. We are at a threshold. And to complete the symbol, uh, the word crown itself. Corona means crown. And it's all about the power of the crown. I mean, in the UK, uh, we need a new relationship with the crown. But it's not just parochial to the UK, of course. This is about governance. This is about power dynamics. Our understanding of democracy in a global context, it's all changing. And of course, in the uh, symbolism of the Kabbalah, if anyone has looked at that myth, then the crown supervenes over the dynamic between the male and the, di and the female aspects of divinity. And that is a crucial point of this response in the collective psyche. So we live this myth. And, of course, we need vaccine, we need ventilators, of course, that's one level of response. But we need response at all levels, and that includes the soul level. That's why I'm talking from a transpersonal perspective. It's not, it's not to downplay 
uh, the physical and biological research we need to do. But what is the situation we're in as far as the collective psyche is concerned? Thank you very much, Les, for amplifying those themes for us. And I can see in the chat window already the reflections coming in around breath, breath as inspiration and the connection to spirit. And keep those reflections coming and we'll, we'll pick up any questions that arise there later on as well. So thank you, Les. I'd like to invite our second speaker for this evening, uh, Kendra Diaz Ford. Kendra is a module tutor and our academic learning officer in the Aleph Trust. She has a PhD in transpersonal psychology and she also teaches at uh, the California Institute of Integral Studies. And her main areas of research are in women's uh, psychospiritual development and embodied ways of practice and knowing, transformative learning and the intersections of, of women's uh, spiritual um, and feminist theory with transpersonal theory. So Kendra, um, over to you. Thank you, Jessica. Hello, everybody. Um, so I want to talk a little bit today about what I'm calling transpersonal self-authorship and what this really roots down into for me is that we're in a place where transformation is inevitable. We did not choose to have this virus. We did not choose to spread it. And we did not know what the profound impact was going to be on our collective psyche, the global markets, local community. What we have choice over at this point is how we, as individuals within this collective movement, within this collective experience, how we want to move forward and what we will choose to adapt, how we will heal together, how we will grow, and perhaps how we will rebuild. And so transformation is something that does not necessarily have to come from a positive experience, but rather can sometimes come from the most deeply unpleasant, challenging, and difficult situations such as the one that we're in. And so what I want to talk a little bit about today is this idea of, of transpersonal self-authorship. And so let me just begin to give some context for this concept of, of self-authorship and, and what it is. The origin of this word or this term or idea comes from developmental psychology. And, um, and it really is about the ways in which we shape our raw experiences and make meaning in our lives. And so as a developmental model, we can look at ourselves as children, right? As a child, meaning making is shaped by the external world. It's fairly simplistic. And as we develop throughout our life, as we have positive, adverse experiences, as we grow, our understanding of the world becomes more complex and our understanding of our reality, both internally and in relationship to the external reality, becomes more complex and perhaps more coherent. And so over time, the underlying logic of how one comes to understand their life in relationship to the world develops an identity, right? And so there's this way in which we, you know, particularly in the 18 to 30s, you know, years of our life that we build this much more profound, complex sense of, of identity, right? And this is really constructed by past experiences and the world around us. It's a time in which the internal capacity to form our own beliefs, value systems, and set of morals takes shape. And this coherent identity is one that is likely to be reinforced for the remainder of a person's lifetime. There may be shifts of growth, but more or less it becomes reinforced. And so while this model offers a cyclical framework, meaning this developmental process can continue to come up again and again and again during a person's lifetime, really this serves as an opportunity for refinement rather than reconstruction. 
And so bringing in this idea of transpersonal self-authorship, what I'm suggesting here, particularly at this moment in time, is the possibility for a reconstruction of values, beliefs, and self-concept. And not just at the individual level, but at the collective level. So that, that we can together begin to look at what values we hold in this moment and what values we choose to become and to develop. And that we do this in response to this deeply profound and transformative time. And that perhaps the breakdown that we're all experiencing via the virus, of course, in our own unique ways and circumstances, depending on where we live, depending on the communities in which we find ourselves, and depending on the ways in which this pandemic has affected us individually, that perhaps this breakdown is creating space for a breakthrough. And so that in that initial construction of self and identity through that initial process of self-authorship that was in response to what was maybe the, the normal demands of life, that because all of this has changed and is still changing, that the conditions of the identity that, that helped shape the identity perhaps are no longer present in the same way. And so the question then becomes, you know, what function or place do these identities or values, the values that have been constructed and created both on an individual level as well as a, a, a collective level, what function do they still have in light of this ever-changing global landscape that we find ourselves in? And perhaps what titles or externally constructed images of reality or self have broken down or shifted? And then that really then begs the question of, you know, who do you want to become? Who do we want to become from this place moving forward? And in that becoming, in that place of considering what it is that we want to become, I want to invite us into what is then the story that we want to tell? What is the story that we want to create? And how does the experiences that we have had, both on an individual level within our own lives and as a collective global community, how do we make meaning from those stories in a way that allows us to move forward in a way that feels much more aligned and coherent? And so I want to bring us to this idea of, of story and to just highlight as I'm coming towards the, the, the end of my short presentation here, to highlight some, some, some of what I understand and feel about story and the telling of our stories. And so when we tell story, whether it's through storytelling, whether it's through rit ritual, whether it's through practice, whether it's through the body, through presencing the body, understanding the story of the body, there's this opportunity to take what has happened, to take these, these questions of what areas of life need to be reconstructed, what aspects of self do I want to take along with me? Who am I today and who, I'm, who am I becoming? That through these raw experiences, through these question, questioning, and then through the then telling of the answers to those questions, however that gets expressed, that there's a revealing of raw, there's an there's a understanding of these raw experiences through the revealing of personal feelings about those experiences in a way that brings understanding, value, and comprehension of what is truly important in one's life. It also allows for this articulation of inner wisdom and truth to be revealed through the telling of this story, not to reinforce the old ideas of self, or to reinforce the old ideas that have been constructed by this old reality or the reality that's been constructed over thousands of years, but to harness the internal wisdom in a way that transforms not only the individual self, but the external reality, removing obstacles to a more integrated understanding of life 
that's based on authenticity and sovereignty. And this sovereignty that I want to end on is that I'm speaking to is a sovereignty that is really described or embedded in the embracing of what is. The embracing of what is in a way that we move beyond these values and images that have been constructed before and instead dissociate and separate ourselves from those previously constructed realities, not in a way to fragment, but in a way to bring ourselves back together into a deeper coherence with the greater intelligence of our individual beings as well as our collective beings. Thank you very much, Kendra, for unpacking this so beautifully for us. And as I was listening to you, I was sensing into my body and this immediately took me beyond my body into our shared body and this sense of the body of earth and the, the larger body that we're all partaking in and the story that we're all a part of. Thank you. And it uh, ties very beautifully into the next presentation that we have um, for you, uh, which is by Stephen Schmitz. Let me introduce Stephen and then I'll hand you over to him. So Stephen Schmitz is an international teacher of shamanism, of ritual studies and transpersonal psychology. Uh, he's also a faculty member of the Aleph Trust and he's also at the Integral Transpersonal Institute in Italy and the Transpersonal Education Institute in Latvia. And he's a board member and a former president of the Association for Transpersonal Psychology in the United States. And he founded the East Bay Shamanic Center in California. He has a private practice of shamanic counseling and shamanic healing. And his current research is on the history of transpersonal psychology and the therapeutic interface of shamanism and mental health. So Stephen, over to you. Thank you, Jessica. <clears throat> and um, very happy to be here with all of you. I welcome all of you to this webinar and I'm very grateful for the opportunity to be a part of it. I'm going to be talking a little bit about shamanism and as most of you know, shamanism is one of the most ancient spiritual traditions known to humankind. <clears throat> it has been around for anywhere from 60 to 100,000 years and it's still endured, it's still being practiced for one main reason that it actually works. And the wisdom and practices of shamanism can benefit us during troubling times of crisis such as this pandemic and contri can contribute, help us contribute to a positive transformation into a very or a much more healthy and balanced and harmonious state. There are many aspects of shamanism, shamanistic wisdom that I could be sharing today, but I'm going to focus on just three. One is the concept of the web of life that people have already been talking about, uh, the, also the importance of community, <clears throat> the benefits of that, and the benefits of ritual. Now the web of life very basically makes us aware of the interconnectedness that Jessica mentioned at the beginning of all, all living organisms, people, creatures, plants, the earth, uh, so even with the spirit world, that there is a interconnectivity between all of us that brings about a lot of healing, a lot of strength, a lot of confidence, a lot of um, really beneficial things that can contribute also to this transformation that we're talking about. The pandemic is something that definitely is involving everyone. It's something, it's very, it's shown us very clearly that we are all very interconnected. This virus is not prejudiced about towards anyone. It's very open to all of us. And it has shown how, what a global community that we currently are. From a shamanic standpoint or a shamanic point of view, it's very important to foster integration rather than separation. And as we know that separation is one of the main problems in our society currently. And so by 
being aware of this web of life and integrating that, by acknowledging the interconnectedness of all life on the planet is a way to help, again, promote this transformation. And to move beyond this problem of separateness to that of togetherness. I have a quote I'm gonna share from Chief Seattle. He said, humankind has not woven the web of life. We are but one thread within it. Whatever we do to the web, we do to ourselves. All things are bound together. All things connect. And I think it's really important for us to remember that all things are connected and whatever we do to others, we do also in effect do to ourself. And what happens to the earth also affects us very closely. Now, community is also a very important aspect in the shamanic paradigm. And coming together in community, we can be strong, we can create miracles, we can foster healing. Communities of togetherness, of working together, of coming together, accepting and respecting each other, through this, we can also contribute to the positive and healthy evolution of our species and life here on the planet Earth. Much positive growth and transformation can take place in a loving, compassionate, and accepting community. We are now very clear with the use of the internet and modern technology that we are living in a global community and that we need to move forward with that way of thinking and living. And I wanna make a comment that a colleague told me that we talk a lot about social distancing. I would like to see people to say physical distancing because it's the physicalness that we need to have distance for, not the social. We need to come together. That leads to how do we work with this? What do we do with some of this wisdom that we have from shamanism? And there's a, a shaman, Maladoma Somme, who's been quoted as saying, where ritual is absent, the young ones are restless or violent. There are no real elders and the grown-ups are bewildered. The future is dim. And I think we all know that in some ways this is a way of looking at or a way of describing our current state of affairs. There are many benefits to practicing rituals and it's something that anyone can do. It could be as simple as taking a walk a few times a week out in nature and really connecting with nature, connecting with spirit, connecting with ways to nourish your soul. Every morning, my wife and I go out into the medicine wheel in our backyard and we do a shamanic morning prayer where we give thanks to the spirits for all the help that they have given us. We ask for protection and guidance. We send healing energy to people in our lives that need that. And we express gratitude for all the blessings that we have. And it's a great way to start the day. It sets a tone for the whole rest of the day. As I said, anyone can perform rituals. All of us can do that. There are certain elements that we can learn, such as the actions, the actors, the places, the times, the objects, the language, and the groups that get together. And it's really, <clears throat> there are a lot of benefits in ritual. They've done research that has shown that Rituals can have a very causal impact on people's thoughts, feelings, and behavior. In time of about to do a stressful performance, we can reduce anxiety and gain confidence. During times of loss, such as these times, it can help us with our grief and moving forward. So to end this talk, I just want to invite all of you out there to actively, consciously, and enthusiastically contribute in your own way, yes, I know, to a positive and co a compassionate transformation and evolution of our species and the earth. So thank you. Thank you, Stephen, very, thank you very much. Let's take a moment's pause. Connect back to the body. Take a breath. You might want to just close your eyes for a moment.
Feel into the body more deeply. Notice the flow of the breath. And maybe as you're doing that, you're making small adjustments to your posture. Noticing what is more conducive, enabling a greater sense of awareness, a connection. Cultivating a posture that is uh, open, receptive, and grounded. And as you're doing that, notice what is stirring within. Maybe you're noticing something on a, on a physical level, somatic sensation calling for your attention. Maybe you're aware of sound. Maybe there's visual information. Maybe there are thoughts. I'd like to invite you to just take a moment to share a little something, to drop that directly into the chat window. If you feel there is something that is resonating that wants to be seen by this community, you can write a sentence or two into the chat window. If there are questions that are calling you, write them into the chat window. We'll take note of them and we'll come back to them later on. So I'll pause just for another half a minute or so to give you some time to write something into the chat window if you feel called to do so. Otherwise, feel free to stay present, sensing, noticing in the body. And staying present, you can pay attention to the stream and the chat window for a moment. Just witness what is being shared. And as these are coming in, I'm going to introduce our next speaker, Javon. Javon Dengili. He has a, an MSc in Transpersonal Psychology, which is actually from the Aleph Trust. And he's now joined our faculty for quite some years, actually, Javon, <laughs> teaching transpersonal coaching. He's a co-founder of the Life Foundation, a non-profit that uh, provides free education and resources to people involved in humanitarian aid or um, environmental sustainability. And he launched the Open Awareness for Change project in February 2020, which aims to empower groups to consciously navigate 
change and to co-create ecological outcomes. And I'm sure he'll unpack this a little more for us now. Javon, over to you. Thank you, Jessica. Good evening, everybody. If it is evening by you or morning or whatever counts, welcome. In the short presentation, I'd like to offer a few different perspectives. And more specifically, I'm going to compare two perspectives. And I will refer to this as perspective logic. So as you can see on the slide, which I hope you can see, there are two diagrams. And I'm going to first draw attention to the first one, which as you can see is a tunnel of sorts. And what we've got here is a depiction of the type of perspective that we find ourselves in when we are stressed. When we're in the fight and flight mode because our life or health is threatened, we find ourselves very naturally in the mode of tunnel awareness. And for good reasons. And this has been built into our psyches and has existed for millennia and in many ways has gotten us as a human species to where we are today. For as a result of being able to activate tunnel awareness instinctively, we've been able to fight, flight, or perhaps even if necessary, freeze or faint in life-threatening situations. So when we're stressed, it is necessary for us to give 100% of our attention to the situation, the object, the person, or the saber-toothed tiger that means to do us harm. And in this way, we're able to react appropriately and instinctively. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. But when we find ourselves pervasively stuck in a mode of tunnel awareness, we are limited to instinctual knee-jerk reactions that inhibit other ways of knowing, other ways of responding, other levels of awareness and various perspectives that can also be a way to us. So what I'm sensing has been going on in the world as this pandemic has arisen, and more specifically in the various reactions that governments and organizations have persuaded populations to follow is a form of collective tunnel awareness in which we have perhaps found ourselves unaware that we are operating in one band of awareness, very separate and cut off from other ways of knowing and responding. And in this mode of tunnel awareness, we have one type of logic, if you could call it that, available to us. And this type of logic I shall refer to as ego logic. It is our ego logic perspective. It serves to preserve our way in which we know ourselves and our way of being in the world. And that way would be what is familiar to us, for it is afraid to go beyond the outskirts of the familiar toward the unknown. Now, in contrast to this, I'd like to also offer another point of view, the ecological perspective. And this perspective is brought about by a different mode of being aware, one that I will refer to as open awareness. Now, open awareness is not an, a new term. It's a mode of perception with a state of calm presence inherent to it that we may find ourselves in when we are unimpaired when there is no fear, no stress, when we are relaxed, open, receptive, and mindful. So I may argue that it's a naturally occurring state. But unfortunately, due to the chronic, pervasive, and collective stress and fear of the paradigm we are finding ourselves in, this state of open awareness becomes one that is difficult to access especially when we find ourselves in this narrow, fixated mode of attending to these little screens of ours, day in, day out. It becomes increasingly difficult to bring that aperture of awareness into a wider, open and receptive mode again, from where we can respond to the situation in a different way. Characteristics of open awareness are 
what I shall refer to as introspection, when we are aware of what's going on within ourselves and we're able to turn attention to our physical needs, our inner needs, looking within and drawing from our inner selves intuition and awareness of what we need for optimal health. Open awareness also promotes outrospection, awareness of others, individuals, groups, other cultures and populations, and awareness of what's going on in the world around us. And what comes with that is empathy, an ability to feel what's going on for others and the world around us and to respond in an empathic way. Yet another dimension of open awareness I'll refer to as envirospection. And envirospection is quite simply being aware of not only the natural environment in which we live and are surrounded by, but also an awareness of living things and systems and the space that connects us as individuals and as communities as part of ever greater living systems. So we become aware of that relational space in which we are all connected. And that mode of perception is what promotes sustainability. For when we find that intersecting point of introspection, outrospection and envirospection, we are in the ecological mode of being, one in which we can make clear, fresh, decisions and choices about how we want to live our life, less determined by the helplessness of tunnel awareness when we need to think outside of the box. So my invitation is to find ways in which you can develop open awareness, cultivate it, embody it, and integrate it into your life. And there are varieties of practices that promote open awareness. Commonly known ones would be meditation, yoga, various contemplative and spiritual practices. And I'm particularly fond of very practical applications of awareness that enable us to become aware of what's in the periphery. One you might like to try on right now is simply to shift awareness from what you might have been focusing on one second ago to the entire volume of space that your whole body occupies. And as you bring awareness into the entire volume of space that your whole body occupies, you may become aware of yourself and what is present for you in a different way. And just this simple entry point into the state of open awareness can enable one to break free from the chains of tunnel awareness and to access deeper levels of knowing, far-reaching ways of connecting and an affinity to the natural environment in which we live our life so that we can make better choices about how to move forward so that we can collectively co-create the paradigm in which we all want to live. And so my take-home message to end this short presentation would be, if you're finding yourself in a crisis situation, if you need to make a decision, any form of planning or goal setting for that matter, choosing a new way forward, then ensure that your decision is an ecological one, that your ideas are ecologically based. This ecological perspective is a win-win-win outcome. You win, those around you win, the environment wins. And that perhaps might be the winning formula of the new paradigm. Thank you, Javon. And uh, as you were speaking, I was again feeling and sensing into that, you know, ever expanding awareness and the body extending beyond the physical into the space around. And of course, the, the long body, the body of the earth. Thank you. I'd like to hand over to Leela Moore, who is also on our faculty. And Leela is a, an artist, a filmmaker, a lecturer, 
and a theorist specializing in technoetic arts, bringing technology and the arts together. She holds a PhD in choreography for the screen from Middlesex University in the UK. And um, she explored there the intersection of the arts with new technologies, um, with spirituality, mysticism and consciousness studies. And um, uh, actually that's also what she did in her postdoc at the Planetary Collegium of Plymouth University. And uh, at the Aleph Trust, she teaches a, um, a course on art, culture and technology, exploring all these intersections. So Leela, over to you. Thank you, Jessica. From the onset of the pandemic, artists from around the world came together, perhaps like never before. Our shared feeling of vulnerability triggered my interest in how artists reacted during critical moments in the 20th century. And I found that most artists reacted, reacted during, basically reacted in a way that they didn't stop making art, even in the worst moment of the first and the second world wars. But unlike previous moments in history, during the quarantine, artists have gathered in groups through the relatively new technology of the web. Despite the closure of museums, galleries, and cultural venues, the arts have entered our living spaces through the computer screen or the mobile phone and became accessible, perhaps even more available than ever. The main discussion in artist groups has, has focused on new ways to make and share art and how to make art for virtual spaces. Moreover, it seems that the arts have become instrumental for mental health. Making art and sharing art during the quarantine has turned into a practice of spiritual immunity. It is therefore appropriate to ask, are we seeing a resurgence of the shamanic, magical, alchemical, mystical and transformative functions of the art? Art is made of metaphoric images and archetypal ideas, which sometimes can initiate us with new knowledge and the invisible aspects of, it, of existence. In the 1940s, artists such as the sculptor Henry Moore in the UK and the filmmaker Maya Deren in New York created archetypal imagery that have allowed people access to the mythic dimensions of their lives, leading them to reflect on the self in the core of their psyche and identity so that they would be able to conceive themselves beyond their immediate circumstances and as, and as a result be able to feel that they are part of a greater process of change. Thus being able to better cope with a volatile reality or events which they were unable to control. And we more for example, made drawings of people taking shelter in the London underground stations during the Blitz. Interestingly, in these drawings, the underground tunnels become primordial caves deep in the earth, protecting humanity. These drawings remind us subliminally that there is a place to go. The earth itself, Gaia, is our protector in times of danger. Currently, we are not in control of the corona and most of us feel the air of uncertainty. Yet from my experience as an artist and um, creator and, and participant in this emerging development, groups of artists and online exhibitions invite people to participate in a vital process of reflection 
the arts become increasingly participatory. Meanings are co-created and artist responses to Corona, which I've seen, offer novel insights that could assist in comprehending the shift that most of us experience, some more strongly than others. The transition of the arts to online spaces has, re has rekindled discussions of the utopic, visionary, social, political, theories of cyberspace. Simultaneously, we witness a growing commitment amongst artists to social and environmental issues. The artist Laurie Anderson stated that the corona, along with the movement of Black Lives Matter, has released an immense surge of empathy. We see waves of people unifying all over the planet via our communication networks. So I ask you to imagine the fibers of our communication systems spreading across the body of Gaia, the Earth. They convey the subtle transactions of our minds and weave networks of a shared consciousness known as the Noosphere or the psychic envelope of the earth. They are the short end of the feed as the thinking layer of the earth. The noosphere, the conscious earth, and the biosphere, the organic, biological earth, are interwoven and co-evolving. In this scheme, technologies are transpersonal, and the arts as creators of novelty have much to offer in terms of dealing with the corona, not just as a virus, but as a living myth and mythic archetype. Artists may become akin to gardeners who are engaged in the caring cultivation of art that grows like a planetary garden, similar to a shamaness or a shaman. The artist is called to be a carer of consciousness. Thank you very much, Leela. As an artist myself, I felt great resonance with what you were sharing there. And actually, I was um, throughout all the presentations I have been uh, drawing, and an image of the Earth is evolving on paper, and it's. Mm -hmm kind of a, a bringing together of all these different perspectives that are being articulated amongst us today, which feel like a web. Um, and they're, you know, a web of themes that are interconnecting, interweaving and joining together. Thank you so much, Leela. I'd like to introduce our last speaker this, uh, this evening, and then we're going to enter into another short contemplative exercise before we then open up the floor to have discussion, uh, to take questions, and so on. So last but not least, joining our panel today is Steve Taylor, uh, who is another member of the Aleph Trust faculty, but he's also a senior lecturer in psychology at Leeds Beckett University. And he's the chair, the current chair of the Transpersonal Psychology section of the British Psychological Society. He's also the author of several books on spirituality, which you may have come across because they've sold um, widely now. And they, they include The Leap and Spiritual Science. Steve is also a poet and he has a book, a new book um, of poetic reflections called The Clear Light. And this will be published later this year. And uh, Steve also writes, he's a prolific writer, he writes a popular blog, Out of the Darkness for Psychology Today. So Steve, it's a pleasure to have you. Over to you. Thank you, Jessica. Thanks everybody for those uh, wonderful presentations so far. So I'm going to um, speak about um, one of my avenues of research in transpersonal psychology and how that applies to our present situation um, with the coronavirus lockdown and in fact all of the crises which we are facing in the world at the moment and the phenomenon 
I've mainly focused on in my research over the past 10 years or so is what I call transformation through adversity. I, I use this phrase transformational potential quite a lot. So every, I think every activity in our lives has some degree of transformational potential, or you could say spiritual potential. Some activities have a lot of spiritual potential. For example, contact with nature has a lot of spiritual potential. Obviously, uh, spiritual practices like meditation or prayer or yoga also have a lot of transformational potential. And some activities don't have a lot of transformational potential. For example, shopping. Has anybody ever had a spiritual experience while they were shopping? I don't think so. Maybe. I could be wrong. But um, I think probably the, the aspect of human life which has the most transformational potential of all is adversity. So in my research, um, I focused on temporary spiritual experiences or awakening experiences, as I call them. And I found that the major trigger of temporary spiritual experiences, and by a spiritual experience, I'm talking about experiences where our awareness temporarily expands and intensifies. So the world around us becomes more vivid and beautiful. We feel a sense of connection. Our being seems to spread out of our bodies into the space around us. And I found that the, the major trigger of these experiences is psychological turmoil, states of depression, loss, grief, turmoil. I found that over a third of these experiences are triggered by psychological turmoil. But also I've looked into what I call the state of wakefulness. And that's when, you could say it's when spiritual experiences are not just temporary, they transmute into an ongoing state of intensified and expansive awareness. And I found also that psychological turmoil is the major trigger of a shift into wakefulness, a shift into a higher functioning, expansive state of being, which often becomes a person's normal state. So this can happen in any number of ways. It can happen when a person is diagnosed with a serious illness, such as cancer. It can happen following bereavement. It can happen after a long period of addiction in which a person gradually loses everything which constitutes their identity and as their life slowly breaks down. And it can also happen in situations of imprisonment. That's an area I've been looking into recently that for some reason, prison or incarceration seems to have a lot of spiritual potential. There are many reports of prisoners having profound spiritual experiences and many cases where prisoners in confinement uh, undergo a permanent shift into a high functioning, wakeful state. And that, that really um, has an application in terms of our present situation because many of us at the moment in the world are living in a state of confinement. And confinement is a great generator of spiritual growth. It has a lot of spiritual potential. And that's why you know, monasteries uh, are great. Um, you know, centers of spiritual development because confinement and solitude and inactivity have a powerful spiritual effect. But I think the main reason why intense psychological, psychological turmoil can have a transformational effect is because it involves a breaking down of our normal ego identity. When we go through intense psychological turmoil, our psychological attachments, which define who we are, slowly dissolve away. And eventually, when our psychological attachments to our status or our possessions or our ambitions or our beliefs, when all of these break down, our identity itself seems to break down. You could think in terms of the building blocks of the ego. When all of the building blocks of the ego, which are psychological attachments, when they dissolve away, then the ego itself dissolves away. Just like a, a building, when, you take, when you've taken away enough bricks, slowly the building itself collapses. In the same way, the ego collapses when its psychological detachments dissolve away. But in some people, there seems to be a kind of latent, higher functioning self which emerges in these situations. So rather than it being solely a breakdown, 
it actually becomes a shift up. A new self emerges into the space in which the ego used to reside. And that new self becomes a person's new identity. So in a lot of these cases, people say that they feel as though they're different people living the same body. In one case, which in which I uh, which I investigated recently, it was um, a person who was addicted to alcohol for many many years, and they underwent a sudden liberation from their addiction. And when they looked in the mirror, they didn't recognize themselves because they felt as though they were a new person. But in many of these uh, transformational experiences, what actually one of the main factors is an encounter with death. I've investigated many cases of people who were diagnosed with cancer or people who had an encounter with death through a sudden medical emergency or accident. And in some cases, the encounter with death, an intense encounter with death, seems to have an awakening effect. The encounter with death dissolves away our psychological attachments. It dissolves away our attachment to the future, to our possessions, to our status. All of these things fade away and a new identity or a new perspective seems to emerge inside us. And I think this transformation can occur collectively as well. As we are collectively facing major crises as a species, in fact, you could even say that we are facing the potential extinction of our species. So we are collectively facing the prospect of death, species death. I think the crises and the collective encounter with death are having an awakening effect. I think that's why in the world, spirituality is exponentially increasing. Interest in spirituality, engagement in spirituality is probably the most significant trend in the world at the moment. And I think that's the result of this encounter, potential encounter with mortality, and as a result of the crises we are facing. So awakening can occur individually and also collectively in the face of adversity. So I'd like to end my presentation with a short poem. It's actually an excerpt from one of my poems called, the poem is called, The Human Race Will Rise Again. And this is a somewhat optimistic, but I think it's great to be optimistic. I think we need to be optimistic. Positivity will increase our own potential for transformation. Negativity will create inertia and it will decrease our potential for transformation. So I think it's very important to be optimistic. So this is an optimistic vision of the human race to the human race's future. It's called, the human race will rise again. The human race will rise again as the cold, hard, masculine mind opens up to the soft, warm spirit of the feminine, as our solid, frozen selves begin to melt and to merge with nature again, as selfishness gives way to empathy and hierarchy to equality, as the impulse to connect transcends the desire for control. The human race will rise again as our senses begin to wake from centuries of sleep, and nature shines with sacredness again, and we're dazzled by the world's pristine beauty, unawed by the depths of meaning which reveal themselves beneath the old flat surface of reality. The human race will rise again, and is slowly rising now. The shift is slowly settling. Balance is returning, a new structure is emerging, a pattern of vibrant new colors and shapes with a new kind of harmony, more complex and dynamic, an order that's stronger because it incorporates chaos, a sanity that's deeper because it arose out of madness. The human race will rise again and life will no longer be a frenzied struggle full of stress and fear, but a glorious adventure full of grace and ease no longer a punishment to be endured, but a privilege to be savoured. We were born for wholeness, and we will be whole again. We were born for joy, and we will return to joy. 
the human race will rise again. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. It touches me that the poem is entitled The Human Race and it strikes me very much that what we seem to be doing in response to the crisis, our first um, impulse is to speed up. We're racing. <laughs> and um, I think you've, you've written elsewhere and said elsewhere that we, we need to become human beings. We, we are human beings, not human doings. Um, and I also recently heard John Kabat-Zinn uh, say something very, very similar. He said, um, we have brought this situation about through our own industriousness, the industrial revolution, our industriousness, our doing, our perpetual doing um, has brought this about. We need to stop producing and consuming and need to enter new ways new regenerative co-creative ways which links into Leela's presentation co-creative ways of um, being together on earth thank you Steve for that presentation let's take another short contemplative pause to connect to the body uh, to notice what is alive for us at this moment in time before we then shift into question and answers and discussion so I invite you to once more connect to the body. As I'm saying that, I'm feeling my feet on the ground. I'm sensing into my spine, how I'm holding myself. I'm relaxing my shoulders. I'm lengthening the spine. Just uh, take a moment to attend to yourself in a way that feels good and conducive for your well-being and your alertness your wakefulness. You might want to close your eyes for a moment and allow yourself to connect more deeply and connect to the body and the breath. And the invitation is to attend, gently softening, sensing inward and outward, to attend to the whole of you. Anchoring awareness in embodied sensations and in the flow of the breath. attending more deeply. Softening into this moment, welcoming it. And from this place, notice what is stirring. Perhaps there is a question, or perhaps there is something that you're noticing, something that is valuable, that wants to be seen, something that is important for all of us here today. So stay present with this sensing and feel free to write something into the chat window. Notice what is emerging. Let's share that. Maybe there are some gold nuggets 
some key points, something that you really would like to share with us today that you'd like the panel to pick up on and discuss? Maybe there's a question that's really burning for you. Now is the time. So take a moment to put your questions, your insights, your observations into the chat window. And I invite you to just stay present with this moment. You may be watching what's happening in the chat window, but at the same time still stay connected. Stay connected to the physical body and the larger body. And I think it would be lovely to share some of the things that are being shared in the chat window. Earlier on as well, there were some lovely quotes from participants here today. So I'd like to invite Francesca and Ellis to read back some of these contributions that have come in today. Brian Holly wrote, what is most important, the action we should take or the silence out of which it arises? Another comment was the acceptance of each moment. Anna Voronko. Janine Hargreave writes, that she's feeling a real need to protect hope and optimism into the world. There's a comment from Jean Fox very early on, who says the masks we're all being asked to wear, make it so we can't breathe. Mm -hmm. Many of our stories about ourselves come from the titles we give ourselves, such as occupation. It's <clears throat> from Jean Fox. I'm getting a little fluctuation on the line there, a little audio wobble at my end. But I'd like to thank you both, Francesca and Ellis, for reading out some of these uh, wonderful contributions that are coming in. And they're coming in so fast, uh, it's difficult to keep up with them all. Um, but thank you for, for weaving in your thoughts. And um, Nick Theo has been keeping an eye on any questions that have been brought up um, during the session. So Nick, would you like to flag some of those questions for us now? to um, kick off the question and answer session. Sure. First, I'd like to share, we did get some by email, and then a few I'm going to combine. Several people were asking on similar themes. So the first one is, what is the role of pain, grief, grit, trauma, shame, in the transformation of a paradigm? Is there a way to truly embrace these qualities as generative? That's a wonderful question. Stephen, uh, Steve, sorry, Steve Taylor, I think that ties uh, into your presentation. I wonder if you could pick mm. this question up and uh, get the ball rolling. Yeah. I mean, obviously, every human being goes through 
intense trauma and suffering at some point in their lives is part of being human. You know, as the Buddha said, life involves suffering. But only a certain number of people, only a small proportion of people seem to be able to harness the spiritual potential of grief or adversity or trauma, whatever ne negative state it may, be, it may be. And I found that um, a quality, well, two qualities really, acknowledgement and acceptance, and also the willingness to explore the state. If you repress your suffering or your grief or whatever it may be, then you close yourself down to its transformational potential. But if you acknowledge it, if you face up to it, if you accept it, which means letting go of any resistance, surrendering, opening yourself to it, then suddenly you can harness its transformational potential. And then you can begin to explore how it makes you fear. You can begin to explore your own state of being. And that exploration is also important. So I'd say acceptance and exploration. Thank you, Steve. I'm wondering if uh, one of the other panelists would like to speak to this uh, theme, which is a very pertinent one. I think it also goes right to the heart of transpersonal psychology, you know, looking at states of emergency as states of emergence. So I'm yes, looking uh, to our panel. Please, Les, yes. Okay. In fact, Alice is also here with us, uh, and I we did some research in this area is also looking specifically at illness and uh, and there's a term post-traumatic growth and there's an increasing literature but i think the way i would want to frame it arising from that work on 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 serious illness is this notion of our wounds you know we all have wounds some are more overt than others, but I think from a transpersonal perspective, those wounds actually can become the, the seeds of growth. And I'm sure that's relevant to the current pandemic that we're talking about. It's very hard to talk about this in a way because it sounds like one is saying suffering is good for you or something like that, and that's crass. It's a more refined awareness, I think, to understand where the seeds of potential lie, exactly what Steve was saying. So, a bit like where I started off, talking about myth. There are so many myths where the wound becomes the driver of transition and change and growth. Thank you, Les. And Kendra, actually, I wonder whether you might want to connect this to the themes of restoring of self-authorship that you mapped out for us earlier. Sure. Yeah. Um, you know, the f there's there's a couple elements, too, that that become lenses in the in the telling of one's story. And, and one is, is curiosity of getting really curious about what are the various elements that have come into place and what is now present. And when we get curious about our experience rather than judgmental, which sometimes can be the default when there's very challenging circumstances that we're dealing with, we can then start to see it from what's happening in our lives from multiple different angles. And I like to liken it, you know, in sort of a somatic perspective, when we are experiencing something very deeply and acutely, we generally have it, it's an experience that is so close to us that we cannot really see all of the angles. Like if you were to take your hand and place it on your chest, and you were trying and you tried to look down at your hand you would see parts of your hand maybe your fingernail but you you can't see the entire hand but if you get curious and you give yourself some space you know maybe that's in the telling of the story it's in the writing of the story it's in embodying it it's 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 giving it sort of a different life we've also talked about art maybe there's a creative expression but there's a way in which you create some space between the experience that's happening and yourself and so if you were to to do that let's say for this example of using the hand when I take my hand away from my chest and create some space between myself my perception and my hand I can then turn my hand around I can see it 
from all different angles, there's some space, there's perspective. And within that perspective, I can get much more curious about what it is that's going on and start to create or configure what it is that I'm going to then do with what it is that I see from a, from a place of perspective. Mm -hmm. And so that's something that comes up for me just in response to that question. And when we do that, you know, in the telling of, of story and in the, the cultivation of what's important and, and, and connecting into, again, right, giving shape to those raw experience from this place of perspective of story, I think it's very important to stay compassionate with the self as that reconfiguration and reconstruction is happening. Thank you, Kendra. And as you're speaking, what comes to my mind there is also what Javon um, emphasized earlier, and that is the ecological perspective. So that the, the kind of work that you're speaking about and, and Les was touching on as well and, and Steve Taylor, it's not just about oneself, but it is also about the larger world, the collective, the individual and the collective, which are inseparable, really. And the question really was touching on the paradigm shift, right? I'm wondering if um, one of the panel members perhaps want to kind of draw the dots together and connect also back to this, the, the inner and the outer. How can inner change and work on the self be of service to the larger collective and possibly lead to a paradigm shift? I'm throwing this out to the panel. So no one else is saying, so I'll come in. And let me connect that point about paradigm shift to something I saw flashing up on the chat window there. There was a question from, I think, Owen about how we transition and the role of ritual. And when I spoke earlier, I said that the first part of this transition we're in involves knowing, knowing that we are living a myth. There'll be a lot more to say about that, but I'll just give you a brief, and I've said a lot already. But that's the first part. And the second part is enacting a new way at that mythical level, and that's ritual. In fact, we have rituals. I mean, many countries are being standing and applauding their health workers. That's ritual. There are many forms of ritual. The most important point, I think, with ritual is intention and symbolism. And I think, you know, all the major traditions have the, the, the practices, the rituals, but they no longer speak to us in the ways that they were intended. They speak to some of us, but not all of us. And I think that's what is about a new paradigm, reinventing those rituals and being conscious of intention. So you can't be conscious of an intention for a ritual unless you know where you're starting from. And I think that's what this session has been all about. Each one of us in our different ways are really talking about that. What is this situation that we're in? Uh, so there's no magic wand to say, okay, well, we need to do A, B, and C. But I think we're raising consciousness. And and we all do that in different ways. I think the Isle of Trust is doing that. It's for others to judge. But to raise that consciousness of what actually is happening. I, as I said very clearly before, it's not simply a virus. It's the movement, the leading edge of the collective psyche. And there are rituals which we have to work on. Thank you, Les. Uh, Nick? I'm wondering if we can bring in um, a couple of observations or perhaps another question from our participants. I'm going to read three questions of the same theme, and we also have about a half a dozen that are similar. How do you extend the shift of consciousness outside and beyond this group? How do we frame a new narrative? for the transpersonal to hold a broader context that integrates 
crisis and breakdown of systems? And how can we leverage the shift that is happening to build an economy from a transpersonal perspective? Wow, wonderful questions, actually. I'm wondering, um, Stephen Schmitz, if I could pass those over to you first off. Okay, yes. Um, yeah, what that brings to mind, it's, um, <clears throat> I think it's really important, you know, how do we reach beyond? Someone else had mentioned, um, you know, how do we take this knowledge, this knowledge that we're getting in this, this present, these presentations today, this gathering of people today, and how do we move beyond it? How do we expand on it? And I think that's really important because it's really easy to sit around like we are and have listened to great people speak and go and feel really good. And it kind of ties in a little bit what Steve said um, about this idea of you know, when we're feeling comfortable, we typically don't put a lot of time and energy into growth or change. When we're not feeling it, you know, that's when we do, when we're in pain, we're suffering, we actually have the energy and motivation to make change. Not to say that we can't change in a positive way, it's just one of the aspects of it. So, one of the things that I think is very important here is to remember or is something that <clears throat> Roger Wall said about the Gnostic intermediary. And a Gnostic intermediary is the person that will travel out kind of like the uh, hero's journey that Joseph Campbell talks about, that we leave what we know, what's familiar, what we've been grown up and we've learned the whole paradigm and worldview of and to venture out and to experience to get to know the diversity of the world and so that we can come to not only know it and acknowledge it also to respect it you know because one of the things about separateness is that we don't respect the diversity we don't respect the differences they become you know justified reasons to keep people away and to not to love and not to share compassion so i think this whole idea about going out and seeing these other ways of being but then it's also important the return the return is very important and i think that's a lot of what's happening in transpersonal psychology right now is that we've gone out we've gone into the eastern traditions, we've gone into the western mystical uh, mystery traditions and we've learned a lot and it's really important to bring this back and to then <clears throat> as a gnostic intermediary we have the knowledge we also know the language of where we came from. And it's important that translation, that way of how can we speak to, let's say, for lack of a better term, the mainstream about these incredible experiences we've had, this incredible knowledge that we have, and how do we translate it in a way that they can hear it? You know, how can we tell, like, who is it? One of the past presidents of Utah said, how do you explain all this to the grocery clerk? You know, it's easy for us because we are, we have chosen this way of being, this way of studying, this way of um, learning. But what about those that may not, that have no, or very little idea about spirituality? You know, it's that translating what we've learned into the old language and also for us to respect and acknowledge the value of that original place we came, to not just leave and leave it behind. Instead, to go back and with the knowledge experience we have, create a healing by going back into the chaos, by going back into the, um, and I, I call it, it's not, it's not stupidity, it's just ignorance. If you don't know about something that's very positive and transformative, you, probably, you may not do it unless you have a crisis like Steve talked about. And I think if people were more aware of it and heard it in terms that they could understand, there would be a huge transformation that could be possible. Thank you, Stephen. 
And I'd like to bring in Leela because uh, I think one of the participants just now mentioned the imagination and its, uh, its huge role in all of this, which connects us to creativity, the imaginal realm. So Leela, can I invite you to respond to these questions as well? Yeah, of course, the imaginal realm and the arts, but also I actually emphasize the arts because the arts have a role and they don't, they, it's not necessarily that obvious. So artists as well have to become conscious of the type of arts or the type of art forms that they are creating. And this is what I was emphasizing, for example, um, uh, the term transpersonal technology, which is not widely known. Um, and for example, so how do you get the message to the people? Um, how will you get them educated? I mean, in a profound way. And how do you, how are we going to get people involved in the new rituals? Um, so, um, for example, uh, there are theories of, and not only theories, there are examples from um, the 60s and from the early 90s of people that wanted to create uh, the media, to, to create some kind of a, a, a worldwide web, which is going to be very different from the one that we have at the moment. Because what we have at the moment is really a very commercial and it's about consumption and selling things online. Uh, this is Facebook, Instagram, etc. And uh, there are other voices that have been around for a long time. And finally, you know, because of the quarantine and because of the pandemic, they, we are hearing them again. And this is about creating new media, new forms of interactions online, new types of um, spaces and um, where communities can gather so they can also gather offline in their communities in their local environments but they also can gather online and create this web but they have to be creative and they can create new rituals and and uh, well it is i think it's it's a process and i think that I mean, I don't want to be over optimistic, but I am optimistic because I would like to. And uh, I think it's like, like, like it was said here, it's really important to be positive and, and visionary and, and uh, we can create uh, new forms of media that uh, will allow people to, um, to transform and to create art which will be able to initiate them with the knowledge, with the shamanic knowledge or with the ancient knowledge and with the new knowledge wants to be born. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Leela. And um, I'm also watching the chat window as, uh, as we're listening to you. <laughs> and this issue of translation is one, isn't it? And there, there, we have, we have, as, as Stephen was saying, we have knowledge that we have inherited, um, and we need to find ways to translate and to bring it, and to share it with many, many people. And yeah, translation of yeah. how to take that, how to make sense again of what we have known before, and how to recontextualize it feels feels really important. Yeah. Yeah, I just want to say that, yes, I mean, but the, we have the archetypal languages and we have the language of symbols, which is the collective language. So whatever we want to say, uh, we have a huge, uh, we, are, we already have uh, a huge resource of images and archetypes that can be reborn and transform. So, uh, I mean, it's, it, through the arts, actually, we can translate uh, ideas and myths very easily. Thank you, Leela. Let's take another question. Nick, please, from the participants. How does one creator choose a spiritual ritual? 
And once you have it, how do you maintain its integrity so it's, it does not decay into becoming a habit? Oh, I love that question. It's, it's a beautiful question. I'm looking around the panel and see if there's somebody who feels called to respond to that. Please feel free to unmute yourself and come in. I can I can say something. Just go ahead, quickly. Kendra. Please, yes. yeah. Um, I mean, one thing about choosing a ritual can I would say can be about resonance. You know, I think sometimes when we think about ritual, we think that it has to be this this um, very grand event. When in 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 truth, it can be something that's very simple. It can be the simple act of waking up and expressing gratitude for having woken up before you put your feet down on the floor and you get out of bed. That in and of itself can become become a ritual over time. It can be as simple as that, or it can be a grand gesture that involves several people, candles, various different um, actions and engagements. And so, you know, I think um, when I, for me, like, I have a I have a practice that I've engaged in for the last 15 years and um, a meditative practice and um, and there are days when sometimes it can feel habitual but the, th the thing that brings me back to it being that engagement that feels like a, a ritual is the intention and the sacredness around it and so I think that that's one piece that I would say how we can keep a ritual sacred is through intention. Thank you, Kendra. Javon, can I bring you in there? Because the kind of work that you do connects to this very much. Thank you, Jessica. So what I might add here then is, well, of course, the value of ritual should not be undermined. But we need not fear that our rituals will become habitual. If they do, they'll become boring, we'll stagnate, and we'll lose interest and we'll drop them. So then the challenge is to reinvent. If we find ourselves plateauing, go beyond the plateau. Establish as part of your ritual a way in which you can monitor the value of your ritual and progress if progress has value to you. But coming back to the piece which I presented earlier, I might like to involve some practice that includes an expansiveness in consciousness as part of my ritual, so that the ritual itself serves that expansion, so that one's aperture of awareness is continually expanding as a product of the ritual. So one can then reflect on the value of your ritual in your journal or through your way of being in the world or through the feedback you get from people that know you and calibrate to the effectiveness of your ritual and if it is stagnating or expanding. But one last word on that would be that any form of ritual ought to be compelling. You ought to be motivated to engage in it. Otherwise, we'll drop it and we'll lose the benefit of a ritual. So perhaps we want to change rituals from time to time, deepen the ritual or practice. But last word now, have a ritual and do it regularly. Mm. As you're speaking, what's coming to me is the sense or the question as to, you know, where's the ritual coming from? Who is inventing the ritual or creating and recreating the ritual? Mm. And if it comes from the, my ego self, then yeah, maybe I'm plateauing because I'm wrapped up in myself. But if I'm hmm, paying attention, opening awareness, just becoming present, then something else in my experience anyway, that's what happens to me when I wake up in the morning I make space for this. I get up, I sense inward, and I follow through. And that simple act of setting the intention of noticing what wants to happen and then following through reinvigorates that feeling of um, a ritual that nourishes me, that enables a kind of expression of, of something other that wants to come through me. It connects us to that wider sense of myth, right? our kind of 
deeper story, attuning to that and letting that speak. Yeah. Which invites creativity mm -hmm. and which in turn evolves the ritual as necessary. Yeah. Thank you, Javon. I think we have time for I, perhaps one more something. question. Stephen, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to add something very quick. Great. That ritual is also, because people say how to create a ritual. Well, ritual is also a way to respond to the call of our soul. And by listening to our soul, and see as what Kendra said, that resonates with you. Make that into a ritual, because then it will have deep meaning and it will not become routine. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Jessica, please. before the last question, I yes, just please, like, yes. yeah, yeah, I'd just like to pick up on a couple of things that I saw flashing through the chat window. Right. Because I think they're, they're very important. I, I can't see them verbatim now, but one was about that we won't be able to reach the mainstream with our kind of inward looking language. Uh, and another was about um, how will we change the economy. And they're wonderful questions. <laughs> And I, I would like to just comment briefly. I don't have the answers. Sometimes questions are more important than answers, actually. But I'll comment briefly. The first thing that, if I think just for myself, I don't know if I'm trying to influence the mainstream. Um, I, I'm interested in the continuation of an understanding of the soul. And there are always many people who are interested in that. What is this mainstream? And if you look, I, I think anyway, in my opinion, I think Steve mentioned this, and then the number of people who actually are becoming interested in spirituality, they may not mention the word transfer song. This is a huge change. So it's not a question of sort of standing up on a soapbox and saying, right, okay, mainstream. Listen to this, I've got something to tell you. It's a question of taking the responsibility that has been passed on to us and we try to pass it on. And that responsibility is knowing the soul, knowing what is the nourishment for the soul and being present with the changes in the world. That Then the point about the economy, I don't know. I'm not an economist. It sounds like a huge problem. All I do know is that there has been a huge upsurge in free offerings during this period. And also, lots of countries have borrowed crazy amounts of money. And where does that come from? And how will it be repaid? Something is going to change, I'm sure of that. But I don't know what it is. I just keep watching. Thank you, Les, and thank you for flagging those those uh, kind of themes that were bubbling there in the chat window, and um, you know this this sense of how we're taking to the it, to the mainstream. Um, for me, that's very concrete because we're all embedded in various contexts, right? Wherever we are with our work, uh, I work in a health setting where I run an arts and health program. I work with public health professionals here in the UK. It's very context specific it's in a particular locality in a particular local authority and I know very much what the context there is so then my task becomes to dialogue with the people who are really embedded there who are doing that work there and seeing how transpersonal ideas can be woven into that context so it gets very specific and very earthy very quickly very real um, so I, I feel maybe we can, you know, sometimes get wrapped up in a kind of abstract image of the mainstream that is out there somewhere, when really we're all in it too, you know, we're not floating bubbles in space. <laughs> um, yeah, and the, the point about the economy is an interesting one. We are all part of that economy too, right? We're aff affecting it and shaping it. How we are consuming and creating has an immediate impact. So perhaps that is also something we need to bear in mind. Looking at the time, we're close to wrapping up, but I wonder whether we can take one more question or yeah, one more question from the audience, please, Nick. Okay, coming from a neurological perspective, how much correspondence is there 
between spiritual orientation and other psychological or psychiatric predispositions such as transliminality, absorption, and openness? That's another wonderful question. I'm looking around our panel and see who would like to take this one on. Yeah, go ahead, Les, if you'd like to come in. <laughs> okay, now let's wait to see if anyone else wanted to speak. I spoke about liminality, transliminality, and, um, and it was just mentioned. Um, and, and yes, neuroscience, neurology, has studied all kinds of syndromes. Um, for example, there are syndromes associated with damage to the temporal lobes. And these are syndromes in which the kind of sensitivity to the sacred or spiritual can be increased. But there are pathological dimensions to that. So it's not a simple equation. You know? um, and so there's, uh, it's, it, it's a question of refinement. We can learn from the neurology. Um, so as I say, someone who has a particular kind of damage neurologically, we may, there are real cases where they, uh, they pray more, they, they hear voices, for example, and who's to say where that boundary between what's real and unreal truly exists, back to boundaries, I was talking about that before. So we learn from studying the neuroscience and, and, and research work showing how different kinds of stimulation of the brain can itself bring about more open and more spiritual states. But we learn from those. We don't want to enter into the, the pathology. We learn from those because they can instruct us of the, cap the potential for um, engaging in these more, if you like, sensitive ways, more spiritual ways. The, it's you. a huge, just very quickly, it is a huge topic, yeah. we haven't got time. There's a, I mean, there's a huge literature on psychiatry and mysticism, and mm. it's a very instructive literature, but it takes more study and more time. Thank you, Les, and uh, I'm aware that we have opened up a vast array of topics uh, this evening. And really, we would like to deepen more into these various aspects that we've all touched upon. And I'd like to thank all the, the panelists um, this evening and all the participants for all the contributions. And um, just to say, we're going to make this recording uh, of the recording of this event available in the coming days. And uh, to wrap up, just to say, if you want to stay in touch with us, if you want to find out more about the Aleph Trust, uh, find out about the kind of courses we offer, then feel free to go on our website and have a look there and uh, you can sign up for our newsletter. But more so, I'd like to say we've really seeded many ideas today and we want to follow up. We want to follow up with you. We want to keep the conversation going. So we're going to host a series of uh, live online sessions on Zoom like this one with each of our panelists over the summer so that we can deepen into the themes that we've explored today and uh, give them all more breathing space, which is very much what is needed. So we'll start that series in the coming weeks and uh, each session will be free. Uh, so keep your eyes on our social media and our website and uh, you can sign up for the newsletter there and we'll share the details as soon as they're ready. But just close the session now, I'd like to um, return to the light with you and extinguish the lamp. But as I extinguish the lamp, can I ask that we take the light into our hearts? Let's do this together.
May our work be of service to all beings on this earth. Thank you all for attending. Good to have you here. I'd like to take a moment to unmute if you'd like to say goodbye. You can say goodbye in your own language. It would be lovely to hear from the different voices in the room. Thank you all. Good night, everybody. Thank good you, night. everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.